All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Spencer Fire. I'll be uh, um, giving a presentation today. Hopefully, you'll find enjoyable about some of the work that uh, that I'm doing here at Florida Institute of Technology. Um, <clears throat> I am a faculty here in the biology department, the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, here at Florida Tech, and I've got uh, one of my graduate students here with me. So, just a um, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I want to mention before we actually jump into the presentation, it should run roughly 40, 45 minutes or so, um, and then we'll go right into answering some of the questions that you may have immediately afterwards. Um, if you do have questions or comments that you want to make during the presentation, you can uh, feel free to type those into the question window on your browser. Uh, so my graduate student, Edna, is going to be um, answering, fielding some of those questions as we go along and, and afterwards. So feel free to feel free to type those into the question window, and she can either answer them during the presentation, or we uh, may address some of those in the question period later. Uh, the presentation also is also going to be recorded, so you can uh, check your email in the next couple of days. Um, where we'll, we will be sending out uh, the slides as well as the uh, the video recording. All right, so having said that, um, we'll go ahead and jump right into what we have uh, prepared for you. Um, so why dolphins are canaries um, using marine mammal strandings to understand the impacts of harmful algal blooms. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why dolphins are canaries just yet. It's sort of a cheap attempt to, to build some suspense. We'll get to that in a little bit later, but wanna, I want to give a little bit of background on uh, what marine mammal strandings are and what harmful algal blooms and hopefully build a story about uh, why, well at least why I find this interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so harmful algal blooms, um, if you hear me refer to these as HABs or HABs, just know that that's what I'm talking about is harmful algal blooms. Uh, you may, in sort of common parlance, you may have heard these referred to as red tides. For example, if you live in Florida, you may be familiar with uh, Florida red tide. Um, we actually don't like, we, um, we meaning uh, oceanographers and, and uh, other biologists like myself, we don't actually like using the word red tide because the organisms that create harmful algal blooms, they're very rarely red um, and often really have nothing to do with, with the tides. So we like to call them HABs or, or harmful algal blooms. Uh, what these are is basically they're, they're, they're natural phenomenon. Um, they are composed of um, single-celled um, microscopic planktonic organisms. They, sometimes we call these um, microalgae or phytoplankton. Uh, but basically, these are the, uh, the base of the marine food web. They're entirely naturally occurring critters that live uh, anywhere there's, anywhere there's seawater. You have phytoplankton. You have um, marine microalgae. So under certain con conditions, whether it be nutrients or sunlight or other physical conditions, sometimes they can um, grow really rapidly or concentrate a lot in a particular area, which is what we call a bloom. So algal blooms are an entirely natural phenomenon. Um, but uh, somehow, uh, a few percent of these, about 2 or 3% of all the marine microalgae species, for whatever reason, uh, decided it might be interesting to become harmful. So that's either um, either because they can produce potent toxins, some of these toxins are neurotoxins, uh, sometimes it's because they can cause mechanical damage to, for example, the gills of fish or cause water clarity issues. Um, but for whatever reason, um, some, um, every once in a while you get an algal bloom that produces one of these toxins or one of these harmful effects and that becomes a, a harmful algal bloom. So just as a, as a general rule, these are, these are bad events or these are things that we try to avoid. They cause a lot of problems for, for people, for animals, for economy, for tourism. Um, but why, why do we care about harf, harmful algal blooms as people? Uh, the main reason is because those toxins can get into our food. Uh, so again, you know, we as humans, we uh, use an awful lot of the marine resources to feed ourselves. Uh, fin fish, shellfish, other uh, marine organisms end up being a, a good source of energy for us. So in cases where you have uh, harmful algal blooms that produce some of these various toxins, uh, those toxins can actually accumulate in the organisms that graze on these, these phytoplankton, on these algae. Um, and those toxins can accumulate to, to levels that are far greater what they're uh, naturally found in in the seawater. Uh, so some of these toxins can cause, depending on the organism that produces it, they can produce a wide variety of, of symptoms and effects. For example, 
Um, paralytic shellfish toxins causes uh, skeletal muscle paralysis, so that's a problem if you know if you enjoy breathing. You know the skeletal muscle that controls your lungs happens to be affected by paralytic shellfish toxins. Um, amnesic shellfish toxins. There's a particular type of toxin that um, causes, among other things, short-term memory loss. Um, these are these can these can actually be lethal effects. So at high enough concentrations, if you as a human are eating large enough um, amounts of you know shellfish or finfish that have concentrated these, that that tissue of that organism can actually become poisonous to you. Um, and in some cases, you know, there's another toxin, diarrheic shellfish toxins. Those aren't necessarily lethal, but can cause some you know pretty uncomfortable and possibly embarrassing symptoms. Um, so that's that's why we care as humans because it gets in our food web. But uh, one of the other things that is uh, relevant to harmful algal blooms, these are even though these are naturally occurring phenomenon. Uh, we as humans tend to have um, a very large impact on our environment, and part of that impact is on marine coastal systems. So, um, although they are natural events um, in places that are experiencing a lot of rapid population growth, like uh, you know Hong Kong or other places in, in East Asia, um, some of the uh, impacts of humans living in these really densely uh, populated areas and all the nutrients that are put into the the ocean environment because of this population growth can actually make Habs uh, a lot worse, or at least a lot more frequent, a lot more severe. And then we fully expect, with all the the uh, the predicted changes that climate change is going to bring about to the coastal oceans, we expect that uh, either the severity or the frequency of harmful algal blooms um, may increase as well. So, what does this all have to do with marine mammals? I, I imagine most of you are probably watching this presentation because you have some sort of interest in marine mammals. Um, so I'll get to that, but first I want to just say what some of the reasons that we're interested in studying marine mammals on their own is, um, you know, for thousands of years there's always been a, a cultural interest in marine mammals. You know, they're they're really charismatic organisms. You've heard them called charismatic megafauna, possibly. Uh, they've always held sort of a place in our culture. Either you know the they represent. Um, you know the spirits of ancestors. They represent the the mythical and you know unapproachable parts of the sea. Um, some folks, it's totally a valid reason. Some folks like marine mammals just because they're cute. Not all of them. Not all of them are cute. Um, but there are you know lots of valid reasons to study marine mammals. But uh, it, from a ecological perspective, one of the reasons that we study them is because again the human impact, um, the the impact that humans have had on the coastal oceans have indirectly resulted in a lot of uh, health threats and actual direct mortality of, of marine mammals. Um, in a lot of cases, as we as you know from the history of commercial whaling, you know, a lot of our baleen whales are, are almost universally at least, at least threatened, if not uh, endangered species. Um, just the commercial fishery impact, you know, we know about dolphin safe tuna. That's one reason <clears throat> That uh, we we have that label on the can is because uh, you know bycatch, which is catching uh, a different species that you intend to catch in a you know tuna net, is a really large source of mortality for a lot of marine mammals. Um, and then just just a, as a natural consequence of having a lot of people living in the world, there's a lot of shipping, a lot of transport, um, and all those big ships make an awful lot of noise. And it turns out that marine mammals use uh, sound much more than uh, much more than their vision to be able to get around, to navigate, to find each other. And then finally, as we know from uh, events like you know, the Deepwater Horizon oil, oil spill, natural contaminants and, uh, and uh, synthetic contaminants are also a really serious health risk for marine mammals. So a lot of reasons why we study those, but why, why study them together? Well, in order to, to give you some context about uh, why marine mammals have anything to do with harmful algal blooms, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of, story, a little bit of a story um, that comes from uh, the West Coast, where this is really the first time that the two of those things became associated in the same context. So in California, there's this uh, this really interesting, beautiful place called Monterey Bay. It's off the central California coast. If you're familiar with the, the Mavericks um, surfing festival, that's just, just up the coast from uh, Monterey Bay. It's got this really, really productive current that comes from the northwest to the southeast called the California Current. Um, it, pr it produces an awful lot of biomass, so it's a really, really biologically productive uh, region of the ocean, which has uh, a lot of great consequences for you know making animals bigger and more abundant, and a lot of the sea life really interesting. But one of the other consequences is it leads to um, a lot of harmful algal bloom-related incidents. So uh, take you back um, to the early '60s. Again, this is Santa Cruz, which is just on the northern end of Monterey Bay. Um, in August of 1961. 
during the middle of the night, there there happened uh, to be the folks who lived in that area started to notice that that all kinds of seabirds were um, flying weird, crashing into their houses, landing on their lawns, vomiting up their stomach contents all over people's uh, you know cars, and you know running into it, just causing causing mayhem. Um, there were you know uh, reports all the, all through the night during this night that these seabirds were uh, you know acting super crazy. It was it was mayhem. You know this is long before 24-hour news. So this was kind of a big deal. It makes the the front page of the Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper. Um, and uh, it well as as history goes. Uh, this uh, this event was sort of made uh, one of the the inspirations for Alfred Hitchcock's movie The Birds. It turns out Alfred Hitchcock was living about 15 miles from Santa Cruz at the time. Called up the reporter the next morning and got the and got the uh, the scoop. And as, as legend has it, at least among among the uh, Hab scientist community, that's uh, that's how we got the movie The Birds, at least in part. But uh, this is a, a very strange uh, incident. The birds were, had uh, what was later to be found neurological impairment. There, there were there was something wrong with their central nervous system. Um, so they didn't actually know what the cause of that event was until much, much later. So we fast forward uh, several years and we find out um, actually a, a coworker of mine who were in the same lab as graduate students had gone back and found some water samples that had been sitting around in the lab from the 1960s from that exact, exact same event. Uh, managed to analyze them. What we'd found um, through that study, as well as just later events with um, harmful algal blooms in the California coast, that there's a particular species of phytoplankton, a particular species of uh, microalgae called Pseudonychia. So this is a, a diatom. A diatom is this really, really small microscopic um, plankton. It's kind of got this silicon shell. It's basically made of glass. If you, any of you have ever spent time uh, you know, cleaning your pool at home, all the stuff that you have to scrub off the side of the, of the pool, that yellow stuff, those are diatoms. So this is one type of diatom. Um, but this diatom happens to produce, just as a part of its normal physiology, a mo molecule called demoic acid. Uh, so demoic acid, we're not really sure why it produces it, we just know what the effects are. Demoic acid, as it turns out, uh, actually is uh, has the same a close enough shape of molecule as one of the neurotransmitters that we humans use, or at least mammals use in our brains for neurons to talk to each other. It's so close that it acts just like that neurotransmitter, and too much of it can cause uh, neurological impairment. So uh, the the typical thing that happens during one of these blooms of Pseudonychia or blooms of any toxin-producing uh, microalgae species is filter feeding organisms, so organisms that sort of strain out seawater and use phytoplankton as food. I like uh, the blue mussel here. This is one of the, the more abundant filter feeding organisms. It's a, it's a bivalve. It's sort of like a clam or an oyster. Um, it concentrates this demoic acid in its tissues to such huge levels that it actually becomes poisonous to anything that eats it. So it's not just clams and bivalves and mussels, but really any organism that's, that is a filter feeder, right? something that can strain out the water, take the phytoplankton, and concentrate all that stuff for food, also happens to concentrate that toxin. So these types of organisms, these filter feeding shellfish, these filter feeding fish like anchovies and sardines, they can really, really accumulate high levels of this toxin during a harmful algal bloom event. Okay, so again, I told you this is going to be about marine mammals, so this is the part where they actually coincide. So fast forward 40 years, this is you know past the Marine Mammal Protection Act, past, past the Endangered Species Act. Um, we've got um, the in, in the minds of all of our uh, neighbors in California, they're really uh, centered around protecting and conserving marine mammals because by this point they they know they're very threatened. Um, we had another. Um, a uh, really intense harmful algal bloom with the same species of diatom, the same Pseudonychia, producing the same toxin. Except this time, um, it was a really, really abundant one. This is a chlorophyll image taken from satellite of Monterey Bay. And just south of Monterey Bay, we see this really thick red patch. That's a really, really high concentration of Pseudonychia producing this demoic acid. And the result of, of that was really the first large-scale marine mortality event uh, that had been known to be caused by a harmful algal bloom. Uh, up to this time, it was really mostly a human health issue. They would close the fisheries when the bivalves and the mussels would get too toxic to eat, but and the occasionally fish would get too toxic to eat, sometimes crabs. But that was really the end of it. It was really just protecting humans from the fishery. This is the first time that, that marine mammals had been affected in such large numbers. And in fact, there was over 400 sea lions that had died in a period of seven or eight weeks. 
um, and demoic acid was detected in, in the high concentrations in all of them. So the interesting part about this is those, those blue muscles that were supposed to be kind of our way of detecting whether uh, there was a problem in the bay, they were negative for demoic acid. So they're, they really had one job is to tell us when there was a big bloom, tell us when there's a lot of toxins in the water, but they kind of failed to do that. So we had to rethink the way we, we looked at the possible impacts of harmful algal blooms on the marine environment. So some of those impacts, again, since demoic acid works kind of like those neurotransmitters we have in our brain that allows neurons to talk to each other, also makes the sea lions act kind of crazy the same way the uh, the seabirds did. So this is, uh, this is a sea lion named Chippy, um, CHP is the California Highway Patrol. Um, one of the symptoms of um, demoic acid intoxication in mammals is aggressive behavior. The, the sea lions that are normally sort of wary of humans sort of lose their, lose their fear of humans. They found one on top of a police car. They found one. Um, Chippy, obviously named after Punch and John from that Chips TV show, if I can date myself here. Um, but the, one of them was found, uh, you know, 75 miles inland in an artichoke field. Um, so one of the, the big efforts that we looked at to understand how this toxin was affecting these sea lions um, was to look at how it was affecting the parts of their brain that that demoic acid concentrates in. So it turns out um, if you happen to know a guy at the local hospital who runs the MRI machine, it turns out you can actually sneak in some of these sea lions on a gurney, wrap them in a, in a sheet, and get them in after hours and take an MRI of their brain to see exactly what's happening uh, from being intoxicated with this toxin. Uh, so one of the symptoms that we found, at least for sea lions, is it causes cell death on one side of the, uh, uh, of the brain. This is a place called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is part of the brain that's responsible for making short-term memory. So you can say this is a difference um, between an, uh, a sea lion that has not been exposed and a sea lion that has been exposed. What those dark spaces rep represent is missing cells or cells that have died and are being replaced with scar tissue. So that's one of the, the indications of demoic acid exposure is you actually lose parts of your brain since those parts of your brain are uh, responsible for short-term memory. That's where we get the term amnesic shellfish poisoning. Um, so the sort of the main reason these things have uh, any any overlap is because we study HABs in the context of marine mammals because they are like this event in 1998. They're a major source of marine mammal mortality. So marine mammals die in large numbers when there's a very intense um, bloom of these critters. So after this 1998 event, we started to notice that. Um, other similar events with similar toxins and similar species of marine mammals started to pop up uh, over the course of several years all across the country. Now that we knew that this was an event, we started to notice it more, we started to look for it more, and we started to notice that whenever we have large-scale or large-scale harmful algal blooms, we tended to have large-scale wildlife events, and a lot of times those wildlife are marine mammals. So after that 1998 event, a couple of years later, along the same section of coastline, 2002, 2003, we started to see additional demoic acid-related mortality events. But this time, it wasn't just um, including uh, California sea lions. We also started to see dolphin mortalities, porpoise mortalities, large whales, sea otters. All these organisms tend to have uh, a lot of overlap in their food webs. They all like to eat um, really, really small fin fish that are filter feeders. So we started to see increases in mortality events, uh, so much so that <clears throat> We started to track uh, the number of these large-scale die-offs. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service uses a, a term called an unusual mortality event to give it sort of an official designation just as a way to track how often it happens. So if you look at all the, uh, this is a graphic, it's a few years out of date, but it still serves its purpose. If you look at all the these unusual large-scale marine mammal mortality events over the last few decades, what you'll notice is there's several different causes. Sometimes they can be caused by you know, viruses or uh, bacterial outbreaks. Sometimes it's because of El Nino, like in the green. Sometimes it's because of fishery entanglement or ship strike. But the red ones here, these are all the ones that are caused by harmful algal bloom toxins. So if we take away the ones, all the black, which is uh, which are events that we don't have an, um, a cause for, um, near half of the uh, all the large-scale marine mortality events were because of 
exposure to harmful algal bloom toxins. And that's kind of a large number when you when you think of what kills marine mammals in large groups. It's not something that really is uh, intuitive. It doesn't really pop into your head. You'd think maybe disease or, or fishery entanglement, but it's really biotoxins that are responsible for a lot of these. Um, which would be okay, I guess, if um, this was just restricted to California, the California coast. But uh, unfortunately, harmful algal bloom species are found just about anywhere. Just every, virtually every coastline has at least one species of microalgae that produces some sort of harmful toxin. So these events happen all over the world, um, which is a problem because so do marine mammals. So this is a, a figure that shows uh, the species richness of marine mammals all across the globe. And what, what you notice here is any place that you have a really high density of marine mammals, these also happen to be the places with really, really high productive coastal areas. And those high productive coastal areas are places where you find a lot of harmful algal blooms, either in severity or frequency. So basically, every place that harmful algal blooms live is also a place that marine mammals will want to live. So there's a lot of overlap in habitat, which is a problem for um, marine mammals. So here's another sh figure that shows the at least the documented impacts on the number of different types of major toxins that have been known to affect wi wildlife and humans across the world. So you'll notice that there are certain places, for example, the Gulf of Mexico, that has lots of different kinds of harmful algal blooms and lots of different types of impacts on uh, humans, seabirds, finfish, and especially marine mammals. So, and but I think the finally and, and the most important reason that we study HABs in the context of marine mammals is what they can tell us about the the state of ocean health. Uh, so I use the word barometer here. For those of you not familiar with a barometer, it's basically it tells you when a storm is coming. It measures um, air pressure or, or pressure of the air. If it gets low, it means there's kind of a storm brewing. Um, but uh, marine mammals can tell us an awful lot about the status of our ocean's health because they are uh, what we call uh, sentinel species. So uh, sentinel species is kind of a word that uh, we uh, marine biology geeks like to throw around and assume people know. But it's really the, the concept of the canary in the coal mine. So for those of you who are familiar with that, that concept, way back in the, in the Back in the days before they had electronic sensors, coal miners would take a canary down with them into the, the bowels of the coal mine because uh, what they did not want to happen when they're mining coal is for them to hit a pocket of natural gas like methane, which happens to be poisonous, but you can't smell it, you can't see it, um, so they wouldn't know until it was too late. So they take a canary with them, which is kind of a really sensitive organism. Um, that uh, would kind of keel over when it gets a little bit of uh, uh, exposure to methane gas. It was then that the, the coal miners knew it was time to get out because their, their health was in immediate danger. So an organism like that that serves a purpose to tell humans when there is some sort of emerging threat or possible threat is called a sentinel organism or a sentinel species. Um, so why marine mammals are really useful in terms of studying them in the context of harmful algal blooms is they can also act as sentinel species. They are one of our most important marine sentinel species for letting humans know about potential health threats to them that come from, from the ocean because we're, uh, we're all built the same, we're all mammals, so what can happen to one, one mammal, we already kind of understand the physiological processes that go on in mammals, generally speaking. So something that can affect a California sea lion or an otter or a whale could very likely affect humans in the same way because we're all mammals. Um, similarly, um, I think it's upwards of 50% of uh, every 50% of the the population of the United States lives within about you know 40 to 50 miles of the coast. So we kind of share the same habitats. Um, we, in a lot of cases, we you know we're apex predators. We're top predators. Marine mammals are also top predators. There's not a lot of things that eat us. We're at the top of our food webs. Um, so we also share a lot of the same prey. We share a lot of the same food. So what can accumulate in one type of fish and kill a dolphin might also be something that can affect human health if those humans have, happen to be feeding on that same type of fish. So it's really the link between uh, human health and ocean health is where marine mammals fill that gap and tell us, tell us a lot about what makes the ocean um, work. So which puts uh, folks like us who study marine mammals and harmful algal blooms in kind of a strange position because they're not really related very closely, at least in a lot of different contexts. They don't have a lot of uh, research going on that matches those two fields of study together. 
Um, so we have to draw on a lot of different sources. We have to work with uh, harmful algal bloom ecologists to you know, work on their microscopes. We have to work a lot with marine mammal scientists who are out in the field taking pictures and understanding the physiology. Um, but in terms of analyzing and detecting toxins, that's where the chemists really shine as they have all their uh, really high-tech instrumentation to be able to detect these toxins at really, really small quantities. And then the rest of us, we kind of, you know, take their credit and write papers. But uh, so why, why is this something that we have really only begun to study in the last really couple of decades or so? Um, most of that is because um, we really didn't have the technology to detect harmful algal blooms or the toxins very well until recent years. Um, so obviously if you go out in the coastal environment, sometimes you can't see very well through the water. It's hard to see an algal bloom unless it's right at the surface. Um, sometimes those toxins don't really manifest themselves until critters start dying. So it's useful to have you know, high-tech instruments to be able to detect these uh, processes before they become harmful. Also in the case of marine mammals, marine mammals are extraordinarily hard to deal with because they spend most of their time underwater, obviously. So it's really only um, in the recent years we've had the technology to be able to put instruments on them, find out where they go, uh, find out what they eat, where they live, how long they spend time there. So it's really the technological advances that have allowed us to sort of study uh, either one in the context of the other. So, uh, which brings us to, to Florida. So here at Florida Institute of Technology, we are also living in one of those one of those areas um, that happens to have a lot of harmful algal bloom impacts. Um, so, for uh, for those of you who are at least from the Florida area or familiar with Florida, um, one of the ones that we deal with most is what we colloquially call Florida red tide. So, if uh, uh, anyone has ever heard of this, and, and remember you guys can also ask questions if you have questions about sort of the more technical aspects of the, the toxins or the species or the area. But uh, the Florida red tide organism, it's actually called Karenia brevis, so it's another type of marine microalgae, another type of phytoplankton. Uh, this one is a dinoflagellate, not a diatom, so it's, a, it's got these little, these little flagella that propel it through the water. So it doesn't produce domoic acid, it grows in a little bit of a different way, it lives in a different habitat, but it also produces a pretty potent uh, neurotoxin. This one is called brevitoxin. So if, if any of you have ever taken a trip uh, to Florida, the beaches in Florida and happen to be unlucky enough to get there during a Florida red tide, you will definitely have that be a memorable experience. Um, there's a lot of uh, upper respiratory tract irritation, so it makes, you, it makes you cough and makes you wheeze and makes your eyes water, and it's generally unpleasant. So as you can see by these poor, these poor uh, lifeguards that have to sit there and, and guard the beaches during a Florida red tide. So this one has a really nice, not nice I guess, but a really dark red color. Uh, also produces a toxin and like other harmful algal, algal bloom toxins, those can get in the food web. Um, so on the, the Gulf Coast of Florida, this is the Gulf of Mexico coast, um, this particular species of uh, harmful algal bloom blooms on average about once a year, typically in the fall, September, October time. Um, and when it does, it can have really, really drastic impacts on the animals that live here. So the types of marine mammals that we have here on the Florida coast, it's basically the bottlenose dolphin here on the left and the Florida manatee. Um, and they are by far the, the, uh, the most impacted species uh, during one of these Florida red tide, one of these habit events. It can result in a lot of, a lot of dead animals, a lot of mortality events. So it causes, it's something that can cause a really, really conspicuous um, response by the, by the public. So it's one of the sort of the most obvi obvious uh, sites to study the impacts of HABs on marine mammals because we have so frequent HABs and so many um, charismatic mammals to, to be worried about. So which brings us to some of the, some of the actual, so I'm going to show you some actual data here um, if you're interested in looking at what we've been studying over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. So one of the, the things we looked at was just how much, how much accumulation of this toxin occurs in uh, bottlenose dolphins in that particular section of Florida where these blooms occur so frequently and so severely. So uh, some colleagues of mine in the, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program on the, on the Gulf Coast they, uh, they've been running the longest running study of wild dolphins anywhere in the world and part of that study is a veterinary health assessment where we basically round up a bunch of dolphins once a year and the vets get a, you know, they basically a vet checkup. So we check their health, check their body size, weights, behavior, blood work to get a sense for, for how healthy they are, if they're not healthy, what types of things are causing them to, to, to be sick. So part of that study, that long-term study, is we looked at different types of tissues and fluid types from these animals to see 
if they were accumulating this toxin and whether those accumulation rates varied depending on whether there was a red tide or whether there was not a red tide. So down here on the bottom, this is a, a series of all the, the times we did a health assessment in the 2000s. And what we found was during the years in this green box, during the years that there were uh, red tides or Florida, Florida red tides during some portion of that year, all of our animals uh, or most of our animals had detectable levels of this toxin. So which kind of makes sense uh, since the, the toxin sticks around for several weeks in, in the body, at least in rodent models. So that was kind of what we were expecting. What we were not expecting is these last three years where there was not a harmful algal bloom, there was not a Florida red tide, we still detected um, pretty significant levels of brevitoxins in the bodies of these animals, which kind of caused us to, to step back and scratch our heads a little bit. If the, if the harmful algal bloom goes away, how do, then, how do we then explain why dolphins are still getting these toxins in their bodies? And if so, what kind of impacts is it having on them? Uh, so we first uh, looked to their prey as a, as a, as a source of a way to answer this question. So uh, bottlenose dolphins in the southeast, they're um, almost exclusively fish eaters. Sometimes they eat a little bit of shrimp and other invertebrates. For, for the most part, they, they, uh, they specialize on fish. So we thought, well, maybe it's because of uh, one of two reasons, either they're getting exposed during a bloom and they're hanging on to those toxins for months at a time, or their food is always kind of a little bit toxic. So one way to answer that question is we, we got, to, got to use a vessel called a Persane vessel. So it's basically drops a curtain-shaped net. It's got a float line and a lead line and drops basically a curtain of net in a circle. And you cinch up the bottom kind of like a purse and you collect a bunch of fish and you can weigh them and identify them. Um, and take them back to the lab to see how much brevitoxin is in their tissues to see who's the who's the fish that's really giving all these dolphins uh, those accumulated toxins. So what we did was we uh, first looked at uh, the fish that we had collected during one of these intense Florida red tide events. So on the y-axis here, this is how many cells per liter of seawater of Karenia brevis this were. It's basically a, a way of saying how severe the bloom was. So during this first section of red tide, we sampled a bunch of fish and tested them for brevitoxins. We waited a while, waited till another red tide, sampled a bunch more fish. And what we found was um, a lot of those fish had really high levels of brevitoxins, which made sense because it was a severe bloom. And one of their favorite fish, turns out the fish they eat the most is called the pinfish, and that happens to be the, the fish that accumulates the highest amount of toxins. So that was a little bit of intuitive, but we also wanted to see, well, what's going on with these dolphins that have toxins when there's not a bloom going on. We also looked at fish sampled all the way anywhere from six to nine months after the last bloom had come and gone away. And even those fish had uh, some pretty significant levels of brevitoxin in their tissue. So we were able to sort of partially answer that question. Well, the dolphins are getting, they have toxins in their tissues long after the bloom is gone because their food also maintains those toxins and keeps them around for quite a long time. Now we're still in the process of um, asking the same question about the fish. Why did the fish get it so long? And I think one of the reasons is possibly because these these cells, these Karenia brevis, are kind of always toxic, at least low levels. But that re that's going to require a little bit more work before we can say um, for sure. Um, so in addition to the you know the physiological impacts, the health impacts of our uh, our favorite species of dolphins in the Sarasota area on the Gulf Coast, we also wanted to know, does it affect the way that they behave? And by behavior, I mean, does it affect where they live, where they feed, what types of habitats they live in? Because um, one reason um, that's important is because if you have to, if you change an animal's behavior, sometimes that can have uh, some serious negative consequences. For example, a lot of animals tend to specialize. They tend to go where the food is the easiest to get or where it's uh, the most nutritious or the most energy efficient. If you cause an animal to use a different spot of its habitat where it's not so good, where the food isn't so good, or where they have to spend more energy getting around, that's going to be a detriment to them as a population. Uh, so one of the impacts we wanted to look at is how does it affect their behavior? Does the presence of red tide cause them to move in other places? Does it cause them to respond in any different way? Uh, so what we wanted to find was do they have a similar behavioral response as humans do? So for example, if you were to go to the beach during a red tide, um, those toxins will become aerosolized, they become airborne, and you would start to cough and wheeze and generally have a bad time of it. Um, we wanted to see if that same response is present in bottlenose dolphins, and can we use that as a way to say yes or no, there is a disturbance response, or no, there is not a disturbance response. So, uh, fortunately, in order to do that, we actually had to take a boat out and 
and put around in the middle of a red tide with all those toxins around. But it turns out that uh, interns will just do just about anything for you if you tell them you're going to go chase dolphins around in uh, in a boat. Um, so we were able to go go out and take samples of water to measure the concentration of Karenia brevis, and we also wanted to follow the animals around to look at their behavior. So one of the interesting behaviors that uh, bottlenose dolphins do is this this behavior called chuffing. So a chuff is uh, basically a really explosive uh, type of uh, breath out. So they, they'll sort of make this sound really loudly, much more loudly than they would if they're taking a normal breath. It's a way for them to, sometimes we think it's to indicate, you know, annoyance or, or you know, if they're unhappy or if we're chasing them too closely, they'll chuff several times in succession. But we thought it's possible that this is also uh, a similar response to the way that humans cough and wheeze when they're exposed to brevitoxin. So what we found was by looking at where the dolphins um, swam around and lived and the concentrations of cells of algae that they were uh, swimming through, we actually found in the places that had the highest concentration of this Florida red tide organism, we also had the highest frequency of this chuffing behavior. So we uh, we concluded that that was an increase in their behavioral response to the toxin, the same way that a human would start coughing and uh, you know having some respiratory issues if they were at the beach during a red tide. But uh, fortunately for for us as researchers, not so fortunately for everyone else, um, the Indian River Lagoon. Um, has uh, um, more than just one toxin, right? So even though the this is the Atlantic side of Florida now, the Indian River Lagoon is, is about 250 kilometers wide, going all the way from Mosquito Lagoon in the north. This is Cape Canaveral. This is where NASA shoots off all the rockets, all the way down to to uh, Jupiter Inlet. So it's a big long stretch of lagoon. Uh, we also have dolphins and manatees in this area, but the Florida red tide organism is not nearly as frequent. It doesn't bloom nearly as often here, although it does still bloom. Um, what we found was in 2007, we had, even though it was rare, we had a really intense bloom of Kareni brevis start up towards the Florida-Georgia border in September and start moving its way south towards this Indian River Lagoon. And, and just for context, this is the, the number of uh, phyto, the number of cells per liter of seawater. So this is a million and change. Just for reference, that's a lot. Um, and by the time it gets to October, it's almost six times that amount. This is a really, really intense bloom of Karenia brevis. What we started to see in October is an increase in strandings, so dead strandings of manatees and dolphins. So the manatees are little triangles here. And when I say stranding, I mean a, an animal that has died and washed up on the beach. Um, so strandings are an indication of a large mortality event. So in October, we started to see manatees start to die and wash up along the shore. And then in November, the, the bloom sort of dies down a little bit, and, but by December, it comes back um, with renewed vengeance, and you start to see uh, another dramatic increase in manatee mortalities, as well as a really brief but intense spike in dolphin mortalities. And then by January of 2008, um, the bloom has mostly petered out, and we see the last of our uh, manatee mortalities. So that was kind of an unusual event, but it was an interesting way for us to study uh, the effects of the same species on an area of coastline that doesn't have really frequent harmful algal blooms. So this right here, this is a, an overlay of the strength of the bloom, which is in the brown circles. This is the, the concentration of Karenia brevis cells per liter of seawater. So there's basically two peaks. So in October, we see a really, a really strong bloom that sort of peters out in November and then comes back really strongly in December. And in the blue, we see manatee mortality. So each one of these is a dead manatee that washed up on that day. And then in the red are dolphin mortality. So we see a sustained level of marine, or excuse me, manatee mortalities during the course of this bloom. And then right around probably about a week and a half before Christmas, a really brief um, peak of dolphin mortalities all close together in time. And the reason this is kind of significant is the frequency that these animals strand during normal years is much, much less than what we saw during this event. So this is sort of the historical average of strandings for dolphins here in the red and manatees in the blue. Um, so this is a, a monthly average over a 10-year period. So we can see during that really brief but intense peak of dolphin mortalities, usually in December you would only get you know three or four um, dolphin strandings. We had at least three, almost four times that many during that month. So that's 
one way we can determine what an unusual mortality event is, is how many times above the normal average is it. And the same thing holds true for, for manatees, at least twice what they normally get during those particular periods of months. So this was unusual because the, the number of animals was much higher than it usually is on average. Um, and even more so, that's along the entire length of the Indian River Lagoon, those averages, but what we found was the the concentration of strandings was in a much smaller geographical area. So there was 14 animals, 14 dolphins that had died in a period of six, 16 days, and really a 75 mile stretch of beach, which is very small, and then another 33 manatees that had died over about a three month period in a similarly small area of the Indian River Lagoon. So what do we learn about that? Well, most of the animals that we tested for brevitoxins turned out to be positive for that toxin. So we led us to believe that this was a cause of mortality during this event. So nearly all of our, our dolphins, 11 out of 12 animals, were positive for toxin. Um, and we can see the numbers here aren't, aren't important, but we found evidence of these toxins in their gastrointestinal tract. So we know was, we were getting it, they were getting it from their food, so gastric BC samples and liver means that they were actively processing those toxins, trying to de detoxify them. Um, same thing holds for our manatees. Most of our manatees were also positive for that for their toxin. They don't eat fish, but they eat seagrasses, and seagrasses are notorious for concentrating brevitoxins on the actual surface of those seagrass blades. So this is another bit of evidence that even even in spite of the infrequency of Karenia brevis blooms in the Indian River Lagoon, <coughs> excuse me, that you can still have um, some pretty severe impacts. Um, and this is just a, uh, to, to show that even though um, the animals were positive for toxins, it still doesn't come close to the, the type of severity that we see in the Florida, Florida animals. This just compares concentrations between a number of different events. This was our Indian River Lagoon event and for our dolphins and manatees. Um, so it was, it's still pretty modest in comparison to the, some of the really more severe marine mammal mortality events. Um, and uh, one interesting thing we found was um, that even though um, the, uh, the fetus, fetal dolphins or newborn dolphins, they're not actively feeding on fish or feeding on their own, they're still getting exposure from these toxins through the mom who is exposed to the toxins. So that was kind of another interesting finding that even, um, that even through placental transfer or transfer of the toxin through the mom itself, you can still get exposure in neonates and uh, fetal animals. So just to close here, um, turns out that Karenia brevis is not the only harmful algal bloom species we have in this part of Florida. Um, we also have a lot of different other species of phytoplankton and a couple of those also are known to produce toxins. So in addition to our Karenia brevis, which is our Florida red tide organism, we also have really interesting critter called Pyrodinium bahamense. So if any of you have ever uh, spent time kayaking in the Indian River Lagoon or even someplace like Puerto Rico where they do bioluminescent kayak tours, this is probably the organism that you've seen. It glows this, this really brilliant bioluminescent um, blue when it's agitated, um, which is nice, but it also happens to produce one of the most potent neurotoxins known to man called saxitoxin, um, super, super uh, potent nerve toxin that causes uh, respiratory paralysis. So if you remember from my one of my first slides, I showed a paralytic shellfish poisoning. This is the toxin that causes that illness in humans. So we also have that going for us here in the Indian River Lagoon. We have two toxin producing species, each of which can have their toxins spread throughout the food web. So they can affect dolphins, they can affect potentially humans and any other critter that feeds on um, animals in that food web that have been um, exposed to that toxin. So as a follow-up to what we found for the uh, bottlenose dolphins, we wanted to see how most of these toxins affect um, our um, animals that live in the Indian River Lagoon when there is a bloom and when there is not a bloom. So what we did is we took a, a big data set of phytoplankton uh, monitoring cell counts basically from the state of Florida and we um, looked at a bunch of different stranded animals over a 14-year period, and we found, um, we basically looked for how exposed was this animal at or near the time of its death. So we took within a 20-kilometer radius of where the animal was found dead and within a 30-day window prior to its death. That was all the cell counts that we took, and we basically assigned a value to, to, to their exposure. So we had an exposed group, ones that were exposed to a lot of cells per liter, and a baseline group, ones that were basically uh, found dead when there was not a harmful algal bloom event around. And we mapped those all out using some fancy GIS software. 
Um, and what we found was uh, over that 14 year period we had two really intense Karenia brevis blooms. So we tested animals that have, were stranded during each of those blooms and animals that were stranded outside of those blooms and tested them for brevitoxins. Uh, what we found was overall about 12% of the animals were positive, but the ones that were found during those blooms, um, almost uh, four-fifths of them, 80%, were positive for that toxin, although the concentrations were nowhere near what we would find in the Gulf of Mexico coast, but they're still there. Uh, also interestingly is the animals that were stranding or dying outside of a bloom were also positive to a small amount, similar to what we found in our Gulf of Mexico coast animals. Uh, so the same is true for our pyrodinium, our really nice, glowy, poisonous uh, critter that lives in the Indian River Lagoon, pyrodinium. Um, pyrodinium uh, happens to bloom much more frequently than Karenia brevis almost every summer. And so we're also able to look at animals that stranded during those blooms and compare them to the toxin levels in animals outside of those blooms. And what we found was, was similar, that uh, about 13% of the whole group was positive. The ones that were stranding during a bloom obviously were much more often uh, positive and had higher concentration of toxins compared to the animals that stranded outside of those blooms. And then uh, finally uh, we also started to look at just uh, where those blooms occur in space to look at how different stocks or different local populations of dolphins might be affected. So for example we have um, pyrodinium tends to bloom in the sort of the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon and Karenia brevis tends to bloom in sort of the more southern part of the Indian River Lagoon. So we expect, um, as we carry on more with research, to find differing levels of concentrations between local populations of dolphins. We expect dolphins that live more in the northern part to have more saxitoxin, less brevitoxin, and vice versa for the lower ones. We'd expect to find uh, more brevitoxin and less saxitoxin in our more southerly populations. So uh, just to, to wrap up, we're, those have given us an awful lot of questions, an awful lot of food for thought. So uh, one of the limitations we have in our research is, is those stranding data, those, those dead animals that we find on the beach, they really only give us a, um, you know, a brief glimpse of what happened to that animal immediately before its death. We don't know what's happening to the animal during the months or, or days or weeks leading up to that animal's death. So there's a lot of things that could be going on. So we really only get a snapshot of that. So because of that, there's a need for us to look at a lot of live animal data. So what's going on with the immune system of these animals? Are they, do they tend to get more disease? Do they get more sick? Do they get more, um, do they get emaciated? So or do they have trouble finding food? Are there all kinds of secondary effects that are not lethal but can still form a health threat for these animals? And so that's one of the, the directions we're headed now to try to look at uh, the immune response and behavioral responses of these animals that, that are exposed to sublethal or um, subacute levels of toxins. Um, we're also interested in finding out, uh, similar to what we found for the disturbance response in Sarasota, did these animals make use of different parts of the Indian River Lagoon when there are blooms? Do they go someplace where there's less toxins available or do they avoid certain places because they're somehow able to, to sense an increase in toxins in their food web? Um, and also we uh, are looking at some other, um, other species of harmful algae that come from discharge from the Lake Okeechobee. So that's another new event we have to deal with now is sometimes we're getting uh, in a large influx of fresh water from this freshwater uh, source that has its own set of harmful algae and toxins that come along with it. So we're, one of the other directions we're taking is to look at um, different toxins that we don't really have any experience with. Are those also affecting our animals? And so that's basically a summary of what we're working on now and it's given us a lot of food for thought and a lot of questions to answer. But uh, with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and uh, thank you for your attention. I'll go ahead and uh, field some questions if you have them. Thank you. All right, so there's a question that uh, looks like Edna has answered a little bit um, as far as um, that uh, how do toxins affect crustaceans and um, Edna has did, done a pretty good job uh, answering that question but uh, I think one of the, the the main aspects of some of these toxins is it has different effects depending on what type of toxin it produces so not all toxins are going to be this is a question for uh, for Radu um, not all toxins are going to have the same the same type of physiological impact because all those molecules are shaped differently and because they're shaped differently they're going to interact with different parts of the brain, different parts of neurons, different parts of other organs. 
Um, so it depends, uh, basically it depends on the type of toxin that's produced. So for example, um, Pseudonychia, which is that diatom that uh, we talked about that kills all the sea lions in California, that's going to have an entirely different um, effect than something like um, Revitoxin that's going to affect mostly um, sort of, uh, well, okay, so Demoic Acid, one of the, the issues is it's a water-soluble toxin, so it dissolves really well in water, which means it can, the body can get rid of it really rapidly. But for other toxins like Revitoxin and some of the, the lipid-soluble or fat-soluble toxins, those tend to stick around a lot longer in the body, so they can have longer-term effects. Even though they're not lethal effects, they can be around for a longer time, you know, weeks or months. Um, and Brevitoxin is one of those. So um, in terms of crustaceans, there's not a whole lot of research done in terms of the sublethal effects. We either know that it causes them to die or it doesn't cause, that, cause them to die, or they get toxic enough that uh, people don't want to eat them or they become safe to eat. So um, crustaceans tend to have a lot simpler nervous systems. So um, in a lot of cases, they're not really affected by the toxins unless they um, unless they happen to be really extremely high levels of toxins. So for the most pa most case, um, they tend to survive, which is one reason they end up accumulating so much toxins because they survive long enough to get really high concentrations and pass them on to their uh, to their uh, predators. Okay, another question here from Ryan it says, are there any uh, long term effects of the toxins? Um, again. Um, that also depends on the type of toxin. So, <clears throat> in the case of in the case of demoic acid, that's one of the ones that we know that has does in fact have long term effects on humans at least. So the first the first time we knew that um, demoic acid was a, a human health risk was there was a really large uh, human shellfish poisoning event in I believe it was Prince Edward Island, Canada. This is in the late 80s, 1987 or so. So there was about 100 people that had, that had eaten some uh, blue mussels that were harvested from that region and were distributed to all the restaurants over a few, over a few days. And 100 people or more that we know of got sick. Um, some of those people actually died. Some of the elderly had died because they were already sort of, um, you know, had, had compromised immune systems. But uh, that's really where we get the, the term amnesic, amnesic shellfish poisoning from, is a lot of those people that uh, uh, were exposed to that toxin for for long afterwards had permanent short-term memory loss. They had trouble forming new memories, um, so it, it uh, interfered with their ability to, to have those parts of the brain that are involved in memory communicate with each other because that, that toxin works just like one of those neurotransmitters that allows neurons to connect to each other. So long-term effects, yeah, those do exist. Um, so for amnesic shellfish poisoning, that, that can be a thing. There's a Another type of toxin that you find in the Caribbean called ciguatoxin. You may have heard of ciguatera fish poisoning. Um, that's really abundant in the South Pacific or in the, in the Caribbean. Um, that's a that's a fat soluble toxin, so it sticks around in in fatty tissues for for years actually. Um, and I've he I've heard of folks who have you know eaten ciguatera poisoned fish and in, in the you know, in the Bahamas or the Virgin Islands, and you know, years later they'll have a recurrence of those same symptoms um, without having eaten any fish in the in-between period. So yeah, there are uh, depends on the chemical, but there are uh, some significant long-term effects of the toxins. But in most cases, they 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 resolve themselves with uh, with proper treatment, at least in humans. We know less about we know less about how they they affect animals, um, just because you know, long-term effects on animals are kind of hard to track unless you can go back and reliably find that animal year after year. Uh, let's see, Olivia has a question. Uh, her question is, whenever you encounter an animal that tests positive for a harmful toxin, what can be done in terms of medication? Is there any way to treat or help that animal? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is a lot that can be done. Um, this is mostly in areas that have really, um, really severe and frequent impacts, like the coast of California. Um, so since, um, you know, Californians, obviously, they love their sea lions. There's a lot of public interest and a lot of money that goes into rehabilitating um, sea lions that strand along that coast during a harmful algal bloom. Uh, there's, there's, uh, so part of the, the, the National Marine Mammal Stranding Network, it's a bunch of uh, biologists and other scientists who go out and recover animals, live or dead. Um, a lot of those facilities actually have rehabilitation centers in them. So an animal, it looks like it's exposed to a toxin. 
it looks like it's probably not going to survive without human intervention. And sometimes, depending on the resources of that, that agency, they'll actually take that animal in. Most, in most cases in California, it's a sea lion. Take that animal in, um, give it a veterinary checkup, and give them um, various medications or other non-medical treatments that allow them to, to basically stay alive until their body has time to process that toxin on its own. Uh, so one of the, the shining examples of that is a place in Sausalito, California, and this is just north of San Francisco, called the, the Marine Mammal Center. And they respond to upwards of six, seven, eight hundred sea lion strandings a year, and they have a, an enormous, well-qualified veterinary staff and veterinary technicians. And that's all they do is they go out during during these uh, pseudonychia blooms, recover six sea lions, bring them back to the center, and uh, you know help them through that tough time until their bodies recover from it on their own. Um, and uh, I guess going back to the, the last question in terms of long-term effects, they actually have seen uh, some of these same animals strand year after year, and they do have chronic effects. They'll have permanent, permanent neurological deficits and sort of a, uh, an epilepsy-like syndrome because they've been exposed multiple times or exposed as, as, uh, you know, as pups, as young animals. Uh, so yeah, so there are a lot of ways you can, you can treat the animal. And sometimes helping the animal is just, you know, giving it, giving it food and giving it water until um, its own body is able to, to process that toxin on its own. Okay, let's see. Um, Radu's got another question. The question is, the red tide algae has predators. Shouldn't their predators have a spike in their population? So um, I assume you're talking about <clears throat> sort of grazing control on phytoplankton. Yeah, so, so Radu, you're exactly right. Uh, phytoplankton are the base of the food web, which means any herbivorous organism, anything that eats on them, should be able to, <coughs> excuse me, should be able to keep those populations in check. Yes, that is true, but it's just a matter of timing. Um, so in most cases, um, the smaller you are as an organism, as a general rule, the more you can divide and multiply and reproduce. Um, so as a general rule, also, if you are a predator, you're typically eating things that are much smaller than you. So, so yeah, in theory, the predators should be able to to um, control those populations and grow um, proportionally, but sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, there's a little bit of a lag. So they can't quite keep up with uh, how fast the red tide organisms are growing. So over time, yes, um, usually it's, uh, it's uh, lysis by viruses, usually it's the viruses that end up controlling the red tide populations. Other times it's uh, zooplankton like copepods and ciliates. Um, they do spike, but it's not until after sort of the, the bloom has reached full intensity. All right, uh, let's see. Victoria has a question. Uh, says, could neurotoxins that imitate neurotransmitters mutate the DNA of organisms, causing them to recreate that toxin or pass it on to their, off their offspring? Um, well, let's see. Um, there are, so brevitoxin, has the ability not to mutate the DNA, but there is some evidence that brevitoxin can actually stick to or bind to DNA. So with, without actually mutating the DNA itself, it can have uh, basically the same result. So you can have um, incorrect copying errors. So if that DNA um, is in charge of making a certain type of protein that the body needs, if brevitoxin is sort of glommed onto that section of DNA, it's going to make an, um, an unuseful protein. That protein is not going to work. So whatever that protein is in charge of, that particular part of the body is not also not going to work um, appropriately. Um, in terms of um, causing that mutation to, to be passed on, I think that has, actually has to be a change in the DNA itself. This is more of a, a preventing the DNA from being copied. So I don't, I don't, genetics is not really my thing, but I don't see that being something that can actually be copied to the next generation unless there is an actual change to the uh, nucleotides there. All right, let's see. Let's answer a couple more. Um, let's go to Ryan. All right, so Ryan's got a question. Do these toxins affect keystone species to the point of having the entire food chain collapse? That is an excellent question, Ryan. Um, so let's see if I can think of an example of that. Yeah, so this example is also going to be brevitoxin. Sorry, they're mostly brevitoxin-centric, but that's kind of, that's kind of my, my thing. Um, so in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico coast in Sarasota that I was talking about earlier, it's one of the more, more well-studied sections of coastline because it has such frequent Karenia brevis blooms. Um, so there's a lot of folks um, who have been working in an area that study not only the, the bloom dynamics, but also 
um, the, the community dynamics, so the ecological relationships, relationships between different species of critters and how they are all affected at different, uh, in different ways from revitoxin exposure. So uh, one of the, there was a, a fellow by the name of Damon Gannon who was a postdoc in my lab when I was a graduate student. He was a fishery biologist, a fishery ecologist, and what he looked at was are there changes in communities, entire communities of fish that uh, occur as a result of a really severe red tide. So what he did was <clears throat> over the course of um, a few years, he'd gone out with his purse standing boat and just collected all the fish that he could find over about a three-year period, documented their sizes, their weights, their habitat, their location. And he found after a really intense red tide that most of those fish were completely wiped out and were and those areas were repopulated with different species of fish. So they come in to sort of fill that gap that these other fish had left. And, and basically what you're left with it was an entire different, an entirely different community of fish. Not the original fish that were there in terms of individuals, but different populations, different species of fish. So they can they can affect um, um, this doesn't necessarily answer the keystone species question, but it can affect an entire food chain. So you're left with different types of fish than you had before. Um, I imagine if you were to um, affect a, if you had, let's say, another, let's say this is a demoic acid producing event in California, the sea otter would be a good example of this. So sea otters are a well-known keystone species. They keep sea urchins in check. Sea urchins are, you know, really voracious herbivores on giant kelp. Um, so if you had an event that was, um, let's say for some reason, a lot of those cells sink to the bottom and are eaten by sea urchins, that would affect that sea otter population. If that sea otter population is harmed or goes away, then you have all those downstream effects. The sea urchin populations increase, the macroalgae populations decrease, and all the critters that live in that habitat can, can be disturbed somewhat. So yeah, those are that's a, definitely a possibility. Um, let's see, we have any other questions here? Let's do last one from, uh, let's see, Raymond. All right, so Edna answered this one. The, the question was, is Revitoxin exposure one of the reasons why manatees are endangered in Florida? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Edna says, um, no, and I agree that it really wasn't the, the main reason, although it certainly isn't helping. Um, they were, uh, Manatees are, have always been sort of um, <clears throat> not very um, rapid reproducers in the first place. Um, so um, hab exposure certainly is a major source of mortality. Um, I think right now we've got close to 6,000 manatees in the state of Florida. Um, the event that I showed you in the Indian River Lagoon, that was 33 manatees. That's about you know 0.5% of the population, and that was a pretty small event. So when we get large mortality events, you can see upwards of, you know, a couple hundred manatees die during events. And that's a significant chunk of the population, but most of the uh, most of the main reasons that manatees are endangered are because of human interaction. So a lot of boat traffic, a lot of boat strikes, um, a lot of times the, uh, the manatees will um, be uh, uh, in warm water areas that happen to be um, inundated by a red tide, so those two things coinciding certainly don't help the, the population. But uh, but uh, in danger, they're really just because of their, they don't reproduce very rapidly and there's a lot of human human health impacts. All right, so I think that was uh, all the questions that need to be answered, but uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, sending you guys out some additional information if you're interested, so check your email within the next few days. I'd just like to Thank you all for uh, your attention. Thank you for your interest in Florida Institute of, Nec Institute of Technology, and we will see you later. Signing off.